Hi friends, most of you watch my channel without a subscription. Subscribe if you like my videos. Have a great vacation. Peter was following his wife for the first time in his life. He had no anger. It would appear after he caught Annette with the one for whom she had come to the capital. That such a meeting would take place, he had no doubt. Why else would she say she was going on a business trip that no one had sent her on? That his wife's trip was not a business trip, Peter found out quite by chance at a soccer match. By some unknown concoction of fate, he found himself on the podium next to Annette's boss, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. The close proximity, the mediocre play of the teams, and the nice weather promoted communication, and they got talking. How's your wife's health? The director asked. Fine, as always, replied Peter. She's going to the Capitol today for a two-day seminar. To the Capitol? Well, that's strange. But I didn't send her anywhere. She asked for two days off at her own expense. Said she wasn't feeling well. Peter, who had been watching the assailant, glanced incredulously at his wife's boss. The interlocutor wasn't lying. His eyes were clear and calm. Maybe I didn't understand something, Peter mumbled, confusedly, momentarily losing the rest of his interest in the game. On the way home, he agonized over what to do, but came up with nothing. Annette behaved as usual. She cooked dinner and called all the household. In the evening, the woman packed a travel bag and drove to the train station. Before she left, Peter asked what hotel she was going to stay at. The wife was surprised by the unexpected question, but answered. After seeing her out the window, Peter realized what he had to do. He sat down at the computer, bought a plane ticket, and booked a hotel. The man told his mother-in-law and son that he was going to his mother to solve some problems. Peter called his boss and took two days off. When Peter arrived at the hotel, he asked to be checked in closer to his wife. The girl at the reception desk checked in that's reservation and availability, smiled and said that Peter was very lucky. There were two empty rooms next to each other. That's where they'll be checked in. Just please don't tell my wife about me. I want to surprise her, Peter said in a conspiratorial tone. Oh yes, of course, the receptionist nodded. I won't say anything. Thank you, he thanked her and went to his room. Peter felt eh, like a spy. Without knowing why himself, he couldn't believe his wife was cheating, even though her lies were obvious. When Annette appeared, he was already in the hotel lobby. The man hid behind a large pot of tropical plants and watched his wife check in. He followed her up to his floor. In the room, he put his ear to the wall and heard the sound of pouring water. Annette was taking a shower. After about an hour, her room door slammed and he hurried after his wife. Annette walked toward the center of town. Peter kept his distance, cautiously watching her. She didn't seem to have a definite goal in mind. She was just taking a walk. A couple of times she stopped at a cafe. Peter, like a true detective, had to eat what he managed to buy along the way. I don't get it, he puzzled. It doesn't look like she's going out with anyone. She's just wandering around, that's all. It's strange. Why did she come here? Maybe she had a meeting gone wrong? Peter followed his wife all day long. By evening, he was so tired of being followed that when she headed toward the hotel, he breathed a sigh of relief. But doubts still plagued him. Perhaps a guest would come to her by nightfall. In his room, Peter went to bed without undressing and listened to every sound. Unexpectedly for himself, he fell asleep. In the morning, the man woke up to the sound of the television in the next room. There was a television program about health. The second day was the same as before. Peter again followed his wife on her heels, but never caught her doing anything objectionable. In the evening, Annette checked out of the hotel and went to the train station. Peter had only to go out after her. In the morning, while he was still asleep, she opened the door with her key. How was your business trip? he asked. Oh, it was fine, she replied. It was the same as always. What do you mean like always, he thought grudgingly. She's going away just to walk around a strange city. But why? 
Finding out that his wife is cheating on him is not an easy thing. It is even harder to watch her hide the truth about the lie. Peter looked at Annette, who was trying to act like nothing had happened, as if she had returned from an ordinary business trip. The wife undressed, went to the bathroom, and soon came out of there with a towel over her head. Peter sensed that she was faking it. Irritation began to boil up inside. He was almost certain that she had gone to the capital to meet her lover. That meeting would have happened if something hadn't interrupted her. Perhaps she had noticed the surveillance. Peter didn't understand why she was doing this to him. What had he done wrong? He had always been a good husband, tried to do everything for the family, took her in with the baby. On top of that, Peter tolerated his mother-in-law in his apartment. He won't wait any longer, and he'll find out right now. Annette, what were you doing in the capital? He began. What kind of strange question is that? She raised her eyebrows in surprise. I know you didn't have a seminar, and don't ask me how I got this information. Why did you go to the capital again? Asked Peter. He couldn't admit that he knew about her deception even before he left, and like an idiot, set up a stakeout. He should have figured it out right away, not played spy. Why aren't you talking? His voice grew harsher. Annette looked tiredly at her husband. Let's talk tonight. I have to go to work. Tonight, grinned Peter. So you can come up with some plausible excuse. Talk now. Annette took the towel off her head and began to dry her hair. She was neither embarrassed nor frightened, only slightly annoyed. Don't stall. Well, insisted Peter. How long have you been going to him? To whom? Annette genuinely wondered. To your lover. You've got it all wrong. I really didn't have a seminar. I just wanted to go for a walk, to be alone. I need it. It's how I recover. Recovering from what? Peter didn't know what she was talking about. It's hard to explain. I call it Alien City therapy. When negativity builds up, I need to get rid of it, not to pour it out on you. Alien City helps, nullifies all the problems. What kind of nonsense are you talking? He said confusedly, and thought her words might be true. You see, Annette went on, as if she didn't hear his remark. In an unfamiliar city, I feel like a tiny particle, a drop in the human sea. Compared to it, my problems begin to seem small, to dissolve without a trace. What are you saying? What problems? What negativity? We are one family. We have everything in common. Yes, but that doesn't give us the right to spoil each other's moods," replied Annette calmly. "What are you saying? I'm always ready to listen to you." Peter was indignant. I tried talking to you, but you said you were sick of my problems and that I was always making things difficult and couldn't live a normal life. Peter didn't remember that, so he stated, "That didn't happen." What do you mean it didn't happen? You also said, "I am sick of you always complaining about your problems." I've got a lot on my mind myself. Peter remembered something similar, but it was a long time ago. Day after day, he himself spouted off to his wife another dose of dissatisfaction with the behavior of her stupid son, intrusive mother-in-law, and frivolous co-workers, in the certainty that he had a right to do so. What else could it be? They are husband and wife, one and the same. You were right, Annette continued. We shouldn't dump negativity on each other. Some people go to shrinks. But I found another way. Besides, I love the capital so much. I didn't think being supportive of your husband was a problem for you. I didn't realize you were looking for a place to zero in. Where do you zero in? In a hotel or right on the train? Annette looked at him in a way that made him realize he'd crossed the line. Guilty people don't look like that. To smooth over the awkwardness, he made what he thought was a weighty argument. How much money did you spend on this? You could have found a cheaper way. No more than I'd spend on a professional psychologist," she said and frowned. Annette lied. The last trip had cost a lot of money. Sooner or later, her husband would find out, and there would be a scandal. Peter was angry. He felt he was beginning to believe his wife, but the irritation wouldn't let go. Since you're so gentle, I won't tell you any more," he declared in full confidence that he was punishing his wife by robbing her of her trust. "Do me a favor," she replied in tone with him. Then I won't need to go anywhere. In that case, what kind of family are we? Why do I need a wife if she can't listen to me? And yes, the conversation is over. The husband stated. He was outraged at Annette's behavior. 
leaving the house, the husband, the child, to go somewhere for two days, to spend the common money on this, was truly absurd to him. See, I'm pouring negativity on her, he grumbled on his way to work. Left alone, Annette wondered. In recent years, she had had a hard time putting up with her husband. On business trips, she managed to get a break from her family problems, walking through unfamiliar streets with no apparent purpose, peering into the city's bustle, sounds, smells. She felt the breath of something far more significant than herself. Looking out the indifferent hotel walls and the lights outside the window, falling asleep in a bed in which hundreds or thousands of other people had slept before her, she began to feel like a speck in a vast, vast world. In that moment, her own problems shrank to the size of a grain of sand. Stranger City Therapy worked without fail. Annette would return home cleansed, soothed, and back to work. But the truth was that she never left for vacation on purpose. She just didn't think it was possible. Her husband wouldn't understand, and she didn't want to deceive him. This time she had cheated on him for the first time, and twice. Annette did not go to the capital to rest but to hand over a million rubles and to save a loved one. Peter was nervous. He pulled out his phone and called his wife. When she answered, Peter stated flatly, you're not going anywhere else, change jobs. Starting tomorrow, I'm going on vacation and going to the country, Annette replied in tone with him and disconnected. It is said that one becomes like the place in which one lives. In a few weeks in a mental institution, George had become like a mentally ill person. A little longer, and he would cease to adequately perceive the world around him, lose the ability to think and forget who he was. It was his wife's cruel, cunning plan that had brought him here. George had no doubt that the reason for all this nightmare was the inheritance. As soon as he stepped into the rights, it all began. It turned out that a highly specialized, closed-care facility with intensive supervision had more than just therapeutic functions. How stupid is this? How irredeemably stupid, repeated George, rocking back and forth in his chair. His whole life has changed dramatically. He had a home, a job, a wife. Now he's in a place worse than death. He had to gather his thoughts and figure out how to get out of here. Memories were drowning in his confused mind. My wife's birthday party, friends came to visit, my wife sat beside me and made me drink to her. This was unusual. She couldn't stand drunks. George was not wary, but absorbed the contents of several shots one by one. He also remembered one of his friends hugged his wife from behind and pressed her against him. This caused George to have an inadequate fit of aggression, and he punched the offender right in the face. They were separated, but he kept screaming and threatening. It was very strange not to like him at all. His wife gave him an injection, supposedly to calm him down, but it only got worse. An ambulance came, they put him on a stretcher, and brought him here. What at first seemed like a misunderstanding became a terrible, endless reality. George never came to his senses. The injections and pills plunged him into a depressed, lethargic state. It became clear that he was being poisoned, not cured. How could a person be held forcibly in a place like this these days? He begged, he demanded to be released, he shouted, but it was to no avail. George pushed for a meeting with the head doctor, but he was refused even that. He tried to protest, to use force, but they tied him up, gave him an injection, and shoved him into solitary confinement ward with bars on the windows. After he calmed down, he was transferred back to the general ward. Three days later, his wife came in with a notary. She demanded that he give a power of attorney to dispose of all his assets, including his bank accounts. George refused. Then his wife threatened that he would become an amoeba in that clinic, and she would take everything from him through the courts, obtaining a declaration of incompetence. When his wife left, George was furious. He screamed and demanded to see the head doctor, but the nursing staff had clear instructions. They twisted him up and left him in solitary confinement. Annette was at work when she heard the sound of the phone, pressed the call acceptance button, and heard an unfamiliar voice. Hello, you don't know me. Does the name Mr. George mean anything to you? 
Suppose so. What do you want? The point is that he needs your help. Why didn't he call himself? He's in a mental institution and doesn't have that option. What clinic? I will visit him. They won't let you in. The fact is that he's being held by force. He thinks the reason is his wife, who has decided to get rid of him. In that case, how can I help? I'm an orderly in this clinic. I can smuggle George out, but he needs somewhere to hide temporarily. He's not his best right now. He's been drugged, and most of the time he's confused. If you can get him out, I'm willing to take him in. I can send you my address. Yes, but I'm not going to do it for free. Understand, I'm taking a great risk. So you want me to pay you, grin at it? Is this a new kind of scam? People used to call and say their relative had an accident, went to jail, and now the new trend is a mental hospital? Annette clicked off. George, what have you gotten yourself into? She whispered. Once upon a time, they were very close. Former neighbors, real friends. Annette was three years older. As a child, that's a huge difference. George was fond of saying that when he grew up, he would surely marry her. They hadn't seen each other in recent years because he had moved to live in the capital. Nevertheless, they kept in touch on social media. Again, a call from the same man. Annette, this is not a hoax. George actually needs help. In that case, I need proof. She replied. What kind? I have to make sure that you know George and he trusts you. Well, that makes sense, but how to arrange it? Annette wondered. Let's put it this way, she said. Have George answer three of my questions. Memorize: What floor did I live on? What was my nickname in the yard? What did he break in my house? I'm waiting. Floor, nickname, and what he broke. Okay, I'll call you back as soon as I find out. The attendant said and passed out. The next day, he called and gave the correct answers to all three questions. There was no doubt, George was really in trouble. It's scary to imagine a healthy man being held in an insane asylum, injected with mind-altering drugs. If the wife did this, how did she do it? She seems to be a doctor. How much money do you want? Asked Annette to the orderly. A million rupees. Are you out of your mind? I'm taking a big risk, maybe even my life. If they catch me, they'll lock me up in that mental hospital too. Besides, I didn't come up with the amount. George suggested it. He said a million won't be a problem for him. As soon as we get him out, he'll pay you back. Why does he think his wife arranged everything? She came by with a notary, demanded to sign some documents. He refused. I don't understand how she managed to arrange all this. She's friends with our chief doctor. They either study together or they're lovers. Perhaps she paid him off too. Strange. Where did George get the money? He's an ordinary engineer. George got an inheritance from his uncle. All right. I'll find the money and a place for him to hide. My mother still has a house in the village. It's empty now. We need to meet. Come to the capital as soon as possible before it's too late. Okay. I'll be there Monday morning. Text me the address and the time to meet. The orderly said goodbye. And passed out. When Annette arrived in the capital, she checked into a hotel and arrived at the appointed time for a meeting at a cafe near the center. The phone rang. Who have you brought with you? She heard the orderly's angry voice. Have you decided to go to the police? I don't know what you're talking about. She replied in surprise. I've noticed a man following you like a tail. Get out of the cafe and walk toward the bridge. I'll see if I'm mistaken. Annette did so. The bell rang again. He's watching you. What does he look like? The orderly described the man. Annette realized it was Peter. That's my husband. I don't know where he came from. She said frustratedly. He was probably just jealous of me. What do I do? Try to get away from him. How? The orderly gave instructions, and Annette tried to follow them. Nevertheless, Peter kept up. He came quite close. He must have been greatly afraid of losing sight of his wife. The orderly called again. When are you leaving? He asked. Tomorrow. Okay. I don't have time today anymore. I have to go on duty. I'll meet you tomorrow. I'll send you the coordinates. They said goodbye. Annette went on her way. Peter never came up. He wants to catch me red-handed, idiot. Annette was angry at her husband. That she hadn't told him about George was still understandable. It was just an exceptional case. Her husband would not allow her to get involved in the story and give money to a stranger, but following his wife was beyond her comprehension. It's strange why he followed her to the capital. What did he suspect? The next day, Peter still pursued Annette. Nevertheless, she managed to hand over the money. 
She met the orderly in a cafe. He sat at a nearby table behind her back and discreetly took the package. Having accomplished her mission, Annette returned home, expecting a scandal from her tracker husband. George's wife was anticipating the pleasures of the life she would soon be living: London, Paris, a house in Spain. The dream was not far off. To get a court order declaring her husband legally incompetent, the hardest part is already done. George is in a psychiatric hospital, and he will get out of there no sooner than his wife will take possession of the property. George's wife had the chief physician under control. It all started back in her college days. In those days, she did not marry him only because George seemed more promising, since he received from his grandmother a posh apartment in the center of the capital. The woman regarded her first marriage as a trial one, and expected to stay there until a better one came along. She considered herself worthy of more. Apart from beauty, she had a sharp mind, tenacious grip, and unprincipled, crushing any barriers. Now she was satisfied with what was going on, but she was irritated by the slowness of the court system, which had scheduled an incompetency hearing only for the end of the month. She was forced to take the drastic step of confining her husband in an insane asylum by an inheritance that had unexpectedly been passed on to her husband. George's uncle died suddenly, leaving him not only real estate, including a cottage by the sea, but also shares of a large company and a solid bank account. She did not want to share all this with her temporary husband, so the cunning wife came up with a way to eliminate him, using the capabilities of an old friend. She and the chief doctor of the psychiatric hospital planned and performed the operation for the incarceration of the rich heir without much trouble. What remained was the legal side of the matter. Her husband did not voluntarily give her power of attorney to dispose of the property, so the wife decided to act through the courts. She did not care about the moral side of the question. After all, why did an ordinary engineer need so much money? He does not even know how to spend it. She did not intend to keep him in the asylum for years. First, she planned to sell the movable and immovable property, buy a house in another country, and then release poor George, handing him the key to a studio apartment on the outskirts or in the suburbs. The plans of the future owner of luxury real estate were ruined by a phone call. The head doctor of the psychiatric hospital called and informed her that George had escaped from the hospital. Escaped? How? She asked confusedly. I haven't figured it out myself. He's nowhere to be found. We've searched the whole clinic. How is he gone? Wailed the woman, who was getting the gist of what had happened. Do you have any idea what's going to happen? We're going to lose everything. Don't worry, we'll find him. The criminal was furious. Look for him, otherwise I don't know what I'll do to you," she shouted. Inwardly, the woman realized that all that had been done was for nothing. It's over. Vivian collapsed in her chair and covered her face with her hands. What to do? Clearly, the plan to embezzle her husband's property had failed, but there's still options after all. First, one could catch George and put him in his place. Second, he could be physically eliminated. In that case, not even a trial would be necessary. Eh, thought the criminal. I should have given him a heart attack right away and not bothered with that clinic. The search for the escaped patient was unsuccessful. No one reported the case to the police. Everyone lay low. Two weeks passed. Early one morning, George's wife heard the doorbell ring, opened it, and saw on the threshold a young woman in a tight suit with a briefcase. Hello, may I speak with you? Come in," she said confusedly. "My name is Annette, and I am the attorney for Mr. George, who is currently your spouse." George's lawyer," his legal wife asked in a saddened voice. "And where is he?" "I know nothing of his whereabouts at the time. He hired me to represent him in court and in pre-trial proceedings." "What do you want?" "First, I have been instructed to take George's passport from you. Can I do that?" The woman hesitated. And do you have a paper of your authority? She asked. Why, yes, of course. Here's a certificate of attorney status and a power of attorney certifying the authority to represent Mr. George. This document has not yet been notarized because there is no passport. Nevertheless, the agreement between me and my client is in writing and is legally binding. Annette held out the papers. The woman looked over the papers. They were dated yesterday. She grimaced and said, "Promptly done." Yes, I don't like to waste time," Annette replied. "So where is his passport? I won't give it to you. 
Let him come to get it himself," said George's wife. "My client cannot come because he fears provocation on your part. He is not going to see you before the trial." "Ah, afraid!" grimaced George's wife angrily. "Fine, let him go far away from me then." "You are reasoning in a fit of emotion," said the lawyer calmly. "I have been instructed to tell you if you do not voluntarily surrender your passport, my client will file a police report for kidnapping, involuntary confinement in a mental institution, and personal injury." George's wife was ready to tear this lawyer to pieces, but the threat of a police report restrained her. She left for the room, returned with her husband's passport, and held it out to Annette. "Is that all you want from me?" she asked defiantly. "No," Annette said, putting the passport away in her purse. "My client's second errand is to collect your apartment keys." With these words, Annette took the keys out of the keyhole in a swift motion and put them in her pocket. George's wife only had time to open her mouth and take a helpless gulp of air. Third assignment, the husband's representative continued, "You must vacate the apartment within three days. If you fail to do so, the police report I mentioned will be filed." To vacate the apartment? You're out of your mind. Where am I going to go? I don't have the answer to that question. I am representing my client here. I can only add one thing for myself. Mr. George is determined, and the charges against you are very serious and punishable under several articles of the Penal Code at once. If the case goes forward, not only the head doctor of the psychiatric hospital will go to prison, but so will you, and there will be a lot of jail time. Think hard on it. The woman clutched her head, and Annette continued. At present, Mr. George is determined to settle the case amicably. If you do not make any property claims and file a joint divorce petition, he will forget where he has spent the past few weeks. Otherwise, as I said, a criminal case will be opened, and you will go to jail for a long time. What shall I tell my client? I'll do anything," said George's wife, muffled. In that case, Mr. George is expecting you tomorrow at ten o'clock at the departmental office in your district. Security will be with him. I warn you about that in case you get the overwhelming urge to set up another operation. See you. Annette left the apartment, leaving the unsuccessful foreign property owner in a completely depressed state. That's it, the criminal said to herself. The game is lost. The idea of becoming George's lawyer came naturally to Annette. She had already been a lawyer for five years, although for the last year she had been mostly engaged in teaching. Annette was forced to change her field of work by a vicious practice. Most clients were not interested in an honest, bona fide defense, but in whether the lawyer could achieve the goal they wanted. The first thing clients asked was whether she had personal connections in the prosecutor's office. The court, the bailiff's office. The answer that she was working under the law caused bewilderment and pitying glances. Annette had long considered leaving the bar association. She was tired of paying her dues because there were fewer and fewer cases. It was a good thing she didn't quit. The education and diplomas of a lawyer came in handy, though this time she managed to avoid a trial. George had no plans for revenge. He did not want to punish the woman he had once loved with prison. His only desire was to get a quick divorce and forget everything that had happened to him. When Annette returned from her meeting with his wife and told her that their plan had worked, George smiled for the first time in a month and a half. Will she come to the departmental office? He asked. She will. Here's your passport and your apartment keys. Thank you. I'd be lost without you. It was time for them to part. It had been two weeks since an orderly had carried George out of the mental hospital in the trunk of his car and brought him to the village. George and Annette have spent most of that time there, with her mother and son. The grandmother and grandson lived in the village house for a couple of months each summer. They toiled in the vegetable garden, bathed, and stocked up on health for the winter. When Annette shared with her mother who she planned to shelter in their house, she only looked at her daughter carefully and said, "Do as you please. George won't bother us, and we won't bother him either." After the orderly called to say that everything had worked out and they were on their way, Annette realized. A new period in her life had begun. She told her husband Peter that she was going to her mother's house in the country. The relationship between the couple was strained, so Peter did not object, but only grumbled grudgingly. I see the rats are fleeing a sunken ship. Annette was not offended by rats. She must have earned the name for her secrets from her husband. But why Peter called himself a sinking ship, she did not understand. Before she would certainly have asked what he meant. 
and would have listened to another story about her husband's hard torment in the career sea of big business. But this time, she didn't want to start a drawn-out, unpleasant conversation. Annette avoided anything that would interfere with her mission to save her friend. All thoughts were focused on how to bring George back to a normal life and rid him of the people who had set out to destroy him. Nothing, Annette thought of her husband. He's not a kid. He can handle it. It doesn't look like we're talking about a shipwreck. So, a little storm. After the quarrel about her trip to the capital, Peter hardly spoke to her. Annette didn't know what had happened to him in the past few days. He was probably just exaggerating. He had no one to share his worries with, which is why he reacts so emotionally and metaphorically. Going to the village, she intuitively felt that she would never return to this apartment again. Annette called a cab, wished her husband a happy stay, and left her home. When the attendant brought George in, Annette was already there. When she met her old friend, she hardly recognized him. He had lost a lot of weight, thought slowly, spoke out of place, but there was a joy in him that he had finally broken free. It took him almost two weeks to recover, and fully recover. In all that time, Peter hadn't called once. Fine, Annette said to herself, let things go as they go. The important thing now is to get George his life back. Annette didn't want to think about her own life going down the drain. She did not dream of a new relationship with an old friend. Is it worth it to rake up the ashes, looking for sparks of an extinguished fire? Annette's mother looked at her daughter with wise eyes. They never had any secrets from each other, except one, who her son's father was. The plan worked completely. George's wife signed a joint divorce decree and vacated the apartment. George immediately began renovating the apartment, wanting to erase all traces of his past life as soon as possible. He returned the money for his bailout, and Annette put it in the family account. She herself returned from the capital to the village. She needed a break to figure out how to live her life. One morning, she was sitting on the terrace, watching her son watering the strawberry beds. Her mother came over and sat beside her. And my grandson looks a lot like his father, she said thoughtfully to her daughter. Which one? Annette didn't understand. He looks like George. So you guessed it, the daughter grinned. Yes, as soon as I saw them together. I knew it all at once. They even have the same gestures. Tell me, why didn't you get married? You know, mother, I never took George seriously. He's younger than me. He and I never had anything except once. He came for a vacation after his sophomore year. It just happened by chance. Does he know? No, I didn't say anything at the time. He left for the capital. He still had a lot of studying to do, and I had already finished university, and I didn't really have feelings for him. It seemed silly for me to call and say, marry me, we're going to have a baby. What a waste. See how he got married badly, almost disappeared. You didn't tell him anything this time either. No, I don't want to complicate things. You see how fate has turned, the mother sighed. Will you go back to Peter? I will, I think he needs me. He's in some kind of trouble. All right, it's up to you, but me and my grandson are staying here for now. Annette opened the door with her key. Peter was home. Her husband looked at her sullenly and said, Hi, I wasn't expecting you. Why? You took money out of the account. I thought you weren't going to come back. I got the money back, she replied and went to the bathroom. She washed her hands and looked at her toothbrush in the glass. Peter hadn't thrown it away so it must have been waiting for her. Annette realized she was homesick. She went into the kitchen, turned on the coffee machine, and made herself some coffee. Do you want coffee? She called out to Peter. Yes, he replied. There's some pasta left on the stove. Eat it, you must be hungry. Thank you. Surprisingly, in her absence, her husband began to cook. Annette made a second cup of coffee and went to Peter. How was your time in the village? He asked. Fine, Annette said quietly. How are you doing at work? I'm being downsized. I'm being transferred from management to the branch. And why didn't you say anything? Wondered Annette. In the old days, he would have blown her mind over this incident. What's there to say? I won't change anything. There's a crisis now. Peter, I decided not to work as a lawyer anymore. I realized it wasn't my thing. You see for yourself what's best. I'm not your advisor. Husband and wife were sitting on the couch drinking coffee. They didn't know what would happen to them next. Peter, I lied to you. I was going away to help a childhood friend. He's in a lot of trouble. 
your son's father? How did you guess? I saw you. I came to the village. Does the son know? No, I haven't told them. Both of them? Yes. Why? I don't know. You should have told me everything from the beginning. I was sure you were going to get in my way, and I couldn't help it. You would have offered to choose one of you. Now did you choose? Yes. Peter rose from the couch, took the empty mug from Annette, and went into the kitchen. Do you want the pasta heated? He shouted from there. Warm it up, please, she replied. If the mast is broken, the ship does not sink immediately. It rushes through the raging waters for a while, hoping that the wind will nail it to shore, where a tree can be cut down to make a new mast. Well, or at least oars.